I think before I came here, the only thing I knew about Texas was that the stars at night are shining bright <laughs> deep in the heart of Texas. I'm so delighted to be here again and well enough to come and speak to you and that wonderful welcome you give me. Deuteronomy 29.29 29 is our text. It's one of the most helpful of the whole Old Testament and one of the most important. Deuteronomy 29, 29. The secret things belong to the Lord our God. But those things which are revealed belong to us and to our children forever. That we may do all the works of this law. The apostle tells us that Scripture thoroughly furnishes us unto for every good work. In other words, whatever providence brings into our lives, blessings, uh, losses, trials, pressures, the Bible is all sufficient to counsel us and guide us and strengthen us and equip us. It thoroughly furnishes us for every good work, every new challenge that comes into our lives. Imagine living in a half-furnished kitchen for years, no electricity, or having a half-finished bathroom with no running water. The Word of God is the total furnishing for every Christian, for the novice and for the dying saint. It's full of profundities. It plumbs the depths. It reaches to heaven. And in many ways, it fully informs the human mind and informs it to the utmost of our capacity to receive these things. It answers very simple questions. What is a woman? It answers an older female. It answers very profound questions. What is God? God is a spirit, infinite, eternal, unchangeable in his being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth. And yet, we may ask it questions, and it is not in a position to answer us. It is adequate for all of us. It is adequate for everything that we may meet in life, but it is not exhaustive. It doesn't tell us everything about the infinite God. It doesn't answer all our questions. And this is the great lesson that stands behind us with our text tonight, that there is a divine revelation, that it is an adequate revelation, and yet also it's a limited revelation. There are secret things, and they are God's secret things, and God has his secrets, just as I have and just as you have. So let's divide it into two, and let's first of all consider some of the details of the secret things that belong to God. Firstly, number one, we can't know the time of the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a secret thing. It belongs to him. It's not that our minds couldn't cope with the fact. It's that God has deliberately kept that information to himself. The Lord Jesus has said it very plainly, of that day, of that hour, no one knows. No, not the angels in heaven, they don't know. Neither the Son of Man, but the Father. He's kept the knowledge of the times and seasons in his own power. And yet, time and again, the mind of the church and the curiosity of God's church has the audacity to pit itself 
against that declared limit on the part of God's revelation. The Lord says, nobody knows. It is past finding out. It's absolutely impossible to give the day and the month and the year. And we have to live with that limitation. We have to submit to it. The great argument of the New Testament with reference to that fact, in such a time as you think not, the Son of Man comes. Our preparedness, our alertness, is not a response to any definite knowledge that we are given, that we've worked out about the time of his return. It is, in fact, a response to the total uncertainty of the day of his return. You don't know. I don't know. Nobody knows when our Lord is coming again. And because of that, we keep ourselves in a state of constant preparedness. When the Son of God shall return in great glory and all his holy angels with him, then that's a secret. That time, that date. A secret thing that belongs. Secondly, how can we reconcile the two great truths of human responsibility and divine sovereignty? Remember, the apostle in Romans chapter 9 brings out so clearly the foreordination of God. Before Jacob and Esau were born, before they had done any good or evil, the Lord had assigned one unto salvation. And the Lord had passed by the other sinner. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. And that is the Lord's sovereignty. Then you remember what happens. He, he's thinking ahead, thinking of us and the church for all the years to come. And he imagines for us an objector. And he raises his hand. <laughs> and, and he says, why then does God find fault? Because no one can resist God's will. No one can go against what God has foreordained. No one can defy God's determinate purpose. Why then, says the objector, confronting the apostle, why does God hold us responsible? for what happens? Why does he apportion blame? Why on the day of Pentecost does Peter say, you with wicked hands have slain the one who was sent by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God? And what the apostle says is this, nay, but O oh man, who art thou that repliest against God? And that seems to me to be the total biblical philosophy of this great problem. We have to affirm with all our might the foreordination of God. We affirm it because it's a great scriptural affirmation. We affirm it because it enshrines the whole principle of the graciousness and the invincibleness of God's application of redemption. We affirm it because it's the precondition of the intelligibility and the comprehensibility and logicalness of this universe in which we live and its maintained laws which keep us sane. And Paul doesn't modify his commitment to foreordination. He doesn't face the objector and say, oh, I never thought of that. Um, <laughs> let me qualify foreordination. No, he doesn't. He lets it stand. There is a divine foreordination that comprehends every physical movement in the universe. 
a star in the east that comes over and hovers over the place where the young child lies. It comprehends the movement of every galaxy. It comprehends the movement of every atom and molecule and subatomic particle. It lies behind the fall of the sparrow. It lies behind every good human decision. It lies behind every sinful human decision. As Joseph said to his brothers, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. It's an utterly comprehensive foreordination. Jesus was delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. And we don't solve this problem of these two realities by denying it. We affirm also the responsibility of man. Paul doesn't say, oh, well, um, God doesn't really find fault. He lets it stand. All things are foreordained, yet God finds fault fault. There is God's sovereignty and there is human responsibility and there is within that responsibility that element of freedom which responsibility requires. And if we are going to be Bible Christians, if we are going to be totally committed to the truthfulness of the word of God, then we affirm them both. We affirm the sovereignty of God and we affirm the responsibility and freedom of man. Men say, don't they, you hear this, that Calvinism is an affirmation of the divine sovereignty and that Arminianism is an affirmation of human responsibility. You hear that. It is a gross oversimplification. But, you know, I would hold very much in the ethos of American and European society as it is today that there is a tremendous danger of bringing into behavior science and into sociology and into criminology and education and law a great element of determinism. The current belief that flourishes is that men and women are prisoners of their own heredity. They're prisoners of their environment. They're prisoners of their education. They're prisoners of their background. And I would say in a climate that is suffusing all those areas of human life, this affirmation we must make very, very strongly that one of human responsibility that you answer to your God what we live in a moral universe and what a man sows that he also reaps and whatever a man's background and whatever the laws of psychology may or may not be man has that freedom from his environment. He has freedom from his genetic makeup. He has freedom from his education. He has freedom even from his own character. He has the freedom in all those directions that leaves him answerable. He is appointed unto man once to die, and then the great day of evaluation. What have you done with all the gifts, all the influences, all the sweet and lovely things that I brought into your life. What have you done? What have you done when you heard of my son, Jesus Christ? And it is in many ways just because God is sovereign that man is responsible. We are responsible to our sovereign, the King of Kings. My concern for the moment is this. We have no right to solve this problem of these two things by dissolving the problem, by denying on the one hand 
God's foreordination and be, by denying, on the other hand, man's responsibility. Both those elements stand on their own independent evidence from Scripture. How Jesus treated, how the prophets treated, how God treated men as responsible. What are you doing here, Elijah? You're responsible for running. We must let both of them stand. When you come to the question, all right, how, how do I reconcile these two? And you may have your theories, and men may have their philosophies, and there may be schools of opinion in answer to this great question. No one has the right to say, here is the theology of the relationship between God's foreordination and our responsibility. There is no such theology. There is no such explanation. There can be theories, there can be philosophies, there cannot be a theology. There's no way you can find it out. It's a secret that belongs to the Lord. And there are riches of wisdom from Genesis to Revelation that affirm both, and they affirm both equally. But there is no way you can find out the nature of the relationship between those two realities. Thirdly, something else that is secret how can you reconcile the fact that there is a narrow way to life and few find it with the fact that the company that are saved are as numerous as the grains of sand on the beaches of the world? Now, there are some Christian leaders and their great emphasis is on the little flock, the little light, in this vast world of darkness. And they never say Christ, Christ will have the majority. They never say that. There's little hope, there's little optimism. But there's another emphasis, which is a much more optimistic emphasis, isn't it? Where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. If the casting away of Israel is the reconciliation of the world, then the reconciliation of the Jews will be life from the dead. And so you have that vision then in the great climax of the book of Revelation. The church is triumphant. It's a multitude. More than any man can number out of every nation and language and tongue. We have a great promise to Abraham that his seed shall be like the sands on the seashore. And I, well, I must say I would deem it very strange in the light of that sort of language if the serpent's seed was more numerous than the woman's seed. I might say it were very strange if even when grace abounds numerically, that sin abounds even more numerically? So what is the answer to this question? Um, are there few that be saved? So they came to Jesus and they heard this stringent ethic, this demand for cross-bearing and taking that load on their shoulders and following their their master, and it seemed so demanding, and they said, are, are there few then? Are there going to be few that be saved? And you know what Jesus' answer was? He says, you strive to enter in. That's his comprehensive answer. You ensure that you yourselves, every one of you, belong to the people of God. His great 
messages, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you're the only boy in the school who professes to be a Christian, the only family on the street that goes to, to church on a Sunday, the only man in this factory. You haven't come across another saved man. He says, it, it doesn't matter if there are many or if there are few. Uh, the gate is open. And whether you are a Jew or a Gentile, whether your family is large or small, whether you come from a respectable or a criminal background, he says, make sure you're one of them, that you belong to them. You say, I am my Lord's, and he is mine. Whether they're in the majority or in the minority, you are certainly invited. You become one of them now. If the future has got persecution for us, or if the future has revival for us, you make sure you are on the Lord's side. It may be a, a, a mystery whether there's going to be a vast number or there's not. But um, it is certainly always true, whosoever will may come and that you are commanded to come, and you are begged to come, and you are pleaded with that you will come. The fourth great mystery, the secret thing, is what is the reason for sin? And here is a question again, which no, no answer is given. It began in heaven. It began in the heart of Satan, and he was an angel created by God of superhuman moral and spiritual sense, strength. And yet at the heart of that perfection, there was sin. And every metaphysician and every amateur theologian and every thinking young believer is going to say, well, how is that possible? Why did that happen? How could such an angel sin? How could sin begin in heaven? How could it begin amongst the sons of God, those great and glorious beings? Um, we know they weren't created, that it was impossible for them to sin. But why? Um, it seems irrational. It seems anomalous. There seems no coherence at all. It, it came from nowhere. It has no logic, it makes no sense, it's a black hole. And then, of course, you come to a parallel question. How did sin come into the human race? It came into the Garden of Eden. It began in the heart of Eve and, and Adam. And they were perfectly upright, they were made in the image of God. They were, in theory, temptation-proof. And everyone seeing them, that... Uh, that day, and a serpent talking to them? Everyone would have said, the angels would have said, They'll, they're all right. They'll never sin. They're so pure. They're so godly. They're so biased in favor of holiness. They're so contented. They're so blessed. They're so deeply in love with God. They're so pure and so spotless. And they would never listen to the tempter. And yet he comes, and in the narrative that you know so well, in five minutes. In five minutes, their resistance is broken. Sin begins in the Garden of Eden. In the heart of the pure place where God can walk as easily as he walks in, in heaven. So, that's a secret thing. How could that happen? But let's, let me just apply that a little bit now closer to you and to me. When you look at sin in yourself, it 
Is it something astonishing to you? Is it something that defies all the logic of what you know of what God has done and is doing in you now? Does it defy any explanation? Or is it for you something very natural? It's a mystery what happened in heaven with Lucifer. It's a mystery what happened with Adam and Eve. But should it not be a mystery that you can sin? Are you saying, oh, well, it's quite explicable? The whole thing is monstrous. Do you know that? Here's a man, an, an ordinary Christian. He's born of the Spirit of God. Jesus Christ lives in his life. The Holy Spirit is there. He has illimitable access to an indwelling Lord. He's a partaker of the divine nature. And he, you, me, we sin. You remember what happened in Corinth. How one of the members of the church was going to a brothel. And you know what Paul says, what he was doing to shock the church with the awareness of the horrendous, unbelievable shame. He was taking the members of Christ and he was joining them to a harlot. My friends, it's utterly unthinkable. We don't know why it started in Lucifer's heart. It's a secret thing. Oh, why Adam and Eve capitulated so quickly, but why do you capitulate? Why do I capitulate? Why do we visit that site and look at those pictures? Why do we retaliate and hurt the people who love us the most and whom we love the most with these careless tongues of ours. And you must say to yourself, I can't do the unimaginable. I can't do the absurd, the impossible. That thing cannot be. So then, um, the fifth mystery, the secret thing, that belongs to God is this question. Am I one of the elect? Has God chosen me? And it is easy to be perplexed. I think Satan, when a person comes closer to Jesus Christ and is being urged to make a commitment now to serve our our Savior, that one of the fiery darts that he throws at us is this matter. Am I elect? People standing on the threshold of faith, pondering whether to follow Jesus. Have I, have I the right? What if I'm not chosen? And they are tormented by this question. Am I elect? Now, you must know this, and I'll repeat it again. There is no way that before faith, any single soul can know that he's a believer, can know that if he's elect, we cannot look into the Lamb's Book of Life. It, it's past finding out. There's a famous story in Wales of a man called John Cadwallader. And he is doubting, and one night he has a wonderful dream, and he looks, and he's in 
the divine temple, and there's a plinth in the front, and there's a wonderful book there, and he walks up to it, it's the Lamb's Book of Life, and he turns over the pages, and he comes to Cadwallader, John Cadwallader, his name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, and he wakes up the next morning and with such joy and delight, and it's, he's never been so happy and knows more certain that he's a Christian. And about 11 o'clock, the doorbell rings, and he goes to the door to answer it, and there's a young man standing there, and uh, he says, Mr. Cadwald, and he says, yes, sir, yes, yes, and who are you? Well, you know that you were, um, your younger brother, 30 years ago, that he emigrated to Australia, and he's never been able to come back. Well, um... I'm his son, and I've come over, and um, um, I'm longing to meet you, my uncle. Oh. Gives him a hug, welcomes him, name, and, and what's your name? Well, my father loved you and your name so much that he, <laughs> he called you John, John Cadwallader. <laughs> And all that certainty and all that confidence and joy of the morning because of the dream the night before had gone. It's a futile undertaking to discover that you're elect before you trust in Jesus Christ. We don't know before faith. We know in faith because of our faith in Jesus Christ is a mark of our election. Or we can say it like this, the Lord Jesus Christ is the mark of our election. If we know we have him or he has us, then I know, then I know I'm elect. But you see, the question before that is, is more important. What's our warrant to come to Christ what right do you have to come to Christ? What right did I have to come to Jesus Christ? Um, did we come? Was there anyone here who came to Christ because he knew he was elected before the foundation of the earth? Did ever any single sinner since the fall of Adam until now, did any one of them, cast themselves on the mercy of God be because they knew they were chosen before the foundation of the earth. We came because we were invited to come. We came because there is a universal offer of God's gospel to every sinner of mankind. That I can say to you tonight, God has loved you so much that this Friday in 2022, he's brought you here because of some invitation, some family concern, some love for you, and, and, and God has used that. But God loves you, and he's brought you here. And he loves me so much, he's made me a messenger of the new covenant. And he's given me a message to tell you of what you must do to be saved. All of you who labor under heavy laden, you stand tonight within the orbit of the offer of God's Son to become your teacher, your protecting king, your shepherd, the Lamb of God that will take all your guilt and sin away. It doesn't matter who you are. You and I have all sorts of disabilities. All of us have got every kind of disadvantage. We've got many, many excuses why it's not going to be tonight that we're going to trust in Jesus Christ. We're so sinful. We are so hypocritical. We are so un unconvinced. We are so unprepared. We are so unusual. We're not like religious mum and dad or the other people we meet in church. And we're all willing to find some point in which we are uniquely disqualified from responding to the invitations of the gospel to come and believe upon the Son of God, Jesus Christ. Though he's here, though he's orchestrated it all, me being here, bringing this message to you, being here tonight. And we have no right before God to do that. No right at all. We don't know whether we are elect 
We don't know whether God has chosen us, but we do know he is sincerely offering his love and his mercy and his son and his salvation to everybody here tonight. We know we are commanded to turn from our unbelief, to end it. We know we are bidden. We know we, we are to believe. The next point I want to say is If you, if you have been taught the most elementary facts of the gospel, if you're a little boy, if you're five, four, if you're six or seven years of age, and if you have been taught to sing, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They're weak, but he is strong. You know that, children. And if you've been taught that every word is true, you know there are little ones your age or younger than you, and they can sing, Now I belong to Jesus. And Jesus belongs to me, not for the years of time alone, but for eternity. You are given a warrant to come tonight and say, I'm going to come to Jesus too. And if you are so old that you're not going to be with us, alas, for much longer. And if you have a soul if you have lived until tonight many, many decades without God, without hope in the world, I have a warrant to give you tonight that you may talk to Jesus, that you may believe upon him. Believing on Jesus Christ is an activity when the Spirit of God uses the words of the one speaking, my words, and he addresses your heart, your conscience. That's what the Holy Spirit is doing now. And, and, and he's drawing you. He's saying, now it's turn, your turn, your time. It's come. This is the appointed time. This is it. For you to believe in me as your Lord and Savior. I make a distinction between uh, two great words. I make a distinction between Christ who is offered to all. I don't mean in a cheap way, but in the way of the servant sent out by the king. Um, go into the highways and go into the byroads and look for, for people that have got nothing and tell them everything is ready. Can you smell in the air this wonderful veal being cooked? Can you hear the sound of music? Uh, that the, there's a feast, and it's for you. Uh, and I'm saying the feast of the bridegroom and the bride, you're being invited to come to it. It's for you. The invitation is for you to come. Uh, I'm making this offer. If you come, there'll be no um, tough man at the door who will slam it in your face. If you come, he says, I will in no wise cast you out. So um, you have the warrant tonight to come. I have that offer that I make to all men. But I can't say I promise you all salvation. I can offer you salvation. I can't promise it. But to those of you who have come, if your faith is as thin as a spider's thread, 
and it is lodged in Christ tonight. It is so strong. It is so unbreakable. It will take you over the bottomless pit. It will take you over the lake of fire. It will present you with great joy in the presence of Christ in that great day. I can guarantee if you come to him, the door is open. He is the door tonight. If you have faith, I can promise you salvation. But I offer this salvation to you all. An infallible, an effectual, a free salvation. I don't know who's elect among you, and you don't know, and no one knows. But there's an offer from God among you. In his great love, he's brought you here tonight to hear how much he loves you. And he wants you tonight, just as you are, to come to the Lord of love and mercy, just as he is. A sincere offer that he makes. My sixth point, then, um, about the secret things that belong to God how often our lives are in such muddles. How often our lives are in such distress. There are such paradoxes. God himself can say, what I do, you, you, you don't know now. But you shall know hereafter why the singleness and the loneliness, why the barrenness, why the miscarriage, why the stillborn, why the handicap, why the pain, why the business collapsed, why the church split, all the problems. You don't know what I'm doing now, but heaven won't be a place where you'll be twisting your hands forever and ever asking why. Then you'll know, even as you are known, you will know what your loving Lord and Savior did. I know there's another side to it, and I, I should mention that. There are great days for the Christian. There are days of joy unspeakable and full of glory. There are mountain tops. There's the possibility of being contented always with everything that God has done for you and in you. There's melody in your heart that goes on in the flames. You can sing songs to your Savior. You can praise him every day, forever and ever. And yet there are trials. And there are tribulations. There are dark valleys. Uh, there are fearful pits. There are days of crushing. There are days of loneliness and despondency. And I have no right to hide those things from you. I have no right to promise you a bed of roses. Blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness. Blessed are they that are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Blessed are you when men revile you and say all manner of evil against you. You're blessed, for they persecuted the prophets and persecuted your Savior before you. He commands, and forth in haste the stormy tempest flies. And there are days when the church looks at one another and the church says to one another, can there be knowledge in God of things below? Does God know what's happening? Does God know what's, what's happened to us, to me, to our congregation? Where is the light in this darkness? And there are humble believers here tonight. And they are perplexed. Good men and women whose hopes have been dashed and they are bruised, and they are broken. And sometimes we have to just hang by our fingertips on this great promise of God. You will know. I will tell you. You will be at peace when I tell you. 
Well, there are, there are those secret things that belong to God, but then there are things that are revealed. And let me close with, with those. The first, of course. There's plenty of light on the question, what must I do to be saved? There are riches of wisdom and knowledge about this. It's not a secret thing. At this point, there are rich answers. The great answer is, entrust yourself, believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. And there's a great mystery here even, in that um, more light is shed in the Bible on the person of Jesus than on the nature of saving faith. It's all about him all the time. Let me tell you about him. Not, I can't analyze the psychology of, of your faith and your belief. Um, faith isn't evoked by a man talking about faith. Faith is evoked by a man talking about this wonderful Savior. This, this man and... Mothers brought their children and gave their children to him. And, and he held them and he prayed for them. And Women sat at his feet and wept. They could entrust themselves wholly to him. A, a woman who'd been abused by man after man met with him. And she said afterwards, come, come with me. Come, I want to introduce you to a man who knows everything about me. I want you to meet him. Men and women, they come to him. There are rich answers. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's a, a, a portrayal of the glories of Christ. Uh, I come to many a pulpit and I see they've written a text which is here prominently before me and it says, Sir, we would see Jesus. And that's why we gather, and that's why we're here these days. We want to tell you about our wonderful Savior, Jesus Christ. God tells us where he is. He's at the right hand of the majesty on high at this moment. And where a number gather in his name, he's here. So he's at the moment, he's, he's moving up these aisles, and he's using my voice to speak to you, and he's nudging you, and he's saying... You know, I, I want you to listen now. I want to tell you these things, the offers, the invitations of Jesus, that if, if we are laboring, if we are heavy laden, if we come to him, ah, oh, he's capable. If everybody here came, he could give everybody rest. He's omnicompetent. He can cope with all of Dallas coming to him. That's what we need. We need to entrust ourselves to him. We need to plead his name. We unrighteous, he righteous. We unable to pay the penalty for our guilt and sin. He has paid it all. So, you see, when you ask, well, what must I do for this great salvation to be mine? What must I do to be an inheritor of eternal life? What mountain must I climb? What price must I pay? What depths must I plumb? What achievement must I effect? Come unto me. He says, go this evening now before you sleep. You don't have to leave your seat. And you have to say to him, Lord, I've looked at my life and I'm appalled. I've heard so many people. I want it covered. I want it covered in the name of Jesus. And you look to the future and you wonder, Lord, how can I cope with growing old and finding a husband or finding a wife and raising children and going into old age and getting illness and facing death? How can I cope with these things by my wits? 
and I need the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, um, say, start to speak to this Savior. He, he, he hears you now. Start to say, um, because speaking to Jesus, we call it prayer, is simply an articulation of what you've come to believe about him. Go to God in the name of Jesus. So, lots of riches about what must we do to be saved, things that are revealed. Secondly, um, how then should we live? Much light on how we should live our lives as Christians. We often make it sound so mysterious, so difficult, past finding out. But aren't there guidelines in the Bible about what sort of husband, what sort of wife you should marry, how you should treat your children, how you should treat your parents, uh, what being a good workman is, what being a good boss is, how to be a good citizen. You have to love your neighbor as yourself. Aren't these things the clearest teachings, the simplest teachings? Aren't the Ten Commandments so simple? Um, I think when people come to me or come to some of you pastors and they saying that they have problems of guidance, when you find out what the problem is, then it's in fact a problem of being in fundamental conflict with the law of God. We pretend that we don't know God's will. Should I marry this person? who has got no interest in the Christian faith or in Jesus Christ at all. That's not a problem of guidance. That's a problem of you responding to what God says in his word is unacceptable and unwise. And time and again, we find ourselves in pseudo-dilemmas like this. We pretend there's an ambiguity. We pretend that it's unsearchable. Uh, uh, abortion. Euthanasia, divorce. And we know in the depths of our hearts that it's not a matter of clarity. It's a matter of our hypocrisy. It's a matter of our pretense. I know only too well that every human being caught in the horns of these dilemmas thinks his involvement in them is unique. And that whereas the law of God applies to every other human being in that dilemma, yet his involvement is different. We imagine that our infidelities, our unwanted pregnancies, our unlawful liaisons, ours are different. Ours are pure. Ours are beautiful. They're not like the others. And you and I have to stand before the unambiguous and the stark clarity of the law that says to us from heaven, this is the way. This only is the way. Walk ye in it. I think that believers Sunday by Sunday ha have to be taught to handle their own problems because of the clarity of biblical teaching. It's a mistake on the part of the Christian church to pretend that it's so complicated to live the Christian life that we must replace gospel pulpits and gospel congregations with massive counseling centers. We've lost our way. We're pretending that it's, it's a mystery. But, you know... Abortion, divorce, depression, worry, loneliness. These are not things that require specialist attention. They require you to go to the Lord about them and speak to him and see what the scriptures have to say and ask your pastor for help and confess you need him to guide you the problem is to accept it. The problem is to handle it. That there's no poverty. God's will is so clear. 
Uh, and I know this not from the angle of counseling other people. I know it from the hypocrisies of my own heart that one can so easily create pseudo-dilemmas and pretend that uh, there's no way we can find an answer. This is a, such a difficult problem, a difficult ethical problem. The principles of how to live your life day by day are amongst the clearest and simplest axioms in Scripture. There are great paradoxes. Where did sin come from? How can God be sovereign and man be responsible? But there's nothing secret about the sanctity of life. And we must be very careful that we don't try to make an ethical decision, a problem of guidance, or that we need specialist pastoral counseling, or even make it a matter of prayer. It's a matter of obedience to what God has said. Then there's a final point and that's so clear, um, where can contentment be found? And so often Christians admire contentment and they long for it and they confess to be strangers to contentment. And they say, if only I had the second blessing, how contented then would I be? And sometimes they blame their upbringing and they bring their personality. They say, my mother was discontented, my grandmother, and so I'm, it runs in the family. It's a matter of genes and chromosomes. Paul says, he learned contentment. He didn't say he picked it up on the Damascus Road. One moment, irritable, dynamic. And the next moment, laid back. He learned it. One day he was at a meeting and there was a little old elder speaking. He said, let's look at Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. He says, I'll not be in want. I'll never be in want because the Lord's my shepherd. Green pastures. They're there before me. Fresh bubbling brooks. They're there before me. How oh, shouldn't we might be much more contented? And Paul listening to this old elder, learned from him to be a contented man. What did he learn? He learned being discontented is a sin. It's a sin against our whole Christian position. We believe our Lord is good and kind and he nowhere burdens us with things that are too heavy for us. He never locks us into a position where every decision we have to make is a sinful decision. There's always a right way, and he helps us in the right way. He works all things together for our good. And then, when certain things come, we can parade the discontented spirit. Shame on us. It's a sin saying, Jesus has done wrong in bringing this into my life. And then he learned it's possible to be contented. Not just a few of the old saints in the congregation that seem at peace, but, but for you in the tensions of young motherhood, in the challenges of being a teenager these days. It's not just an ideal to be admired and praised. He learned it. He learned it, and he became contented. And you can be contented in whatever state you are in, wherever God has put you. There are no circumstances, no set of circumstances can take your contentment from you. It's possible for you to attain contentment in your life. And then Paul discovered how. And I can tell you, without money and without price, how you can be a contented boy, a contented girl, a contented man, a contented woman. It's by taking your stand on this great principle, thy will be done. And so often I'm not contented because I don't want God's will. I don't like God's will. I want my will. 
And no way I am ever going to wear the red jewel of Christian contentment without taking my stand on this principle. What I want in my life is the will of God. And when I can see something, it's God's will, then I won't get angry, and I won't get frustrated, and I won't get depressed or plaintive or self-pitying. This is my Father's will and my delight is to receive it and do it. Maybe there's some folk here tonight to whom that may be God's will, God's word for them in their restlessness, in the things that are revealed so beautifully, clearly, and challengingly in the word of God. That from now on, what's your will for me, Lord? And give me grace to delight in it. Amen. Let's pray. Our gracious and loving God, there are secret things that belong to you and we've thought about them. and We don't understand how some of these things can be reconciled. And oh Lord, there are people here and they've known such pain and... Oh, such tension and such distress in these past months. Oh, Lord, have pity on them and help them. Oh, we bless thee for the gospel. And it's all only beauty and clarity. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Thou shalt be saved. Thank you, Lord. We come just as we are to thee tonight. And we ask thee to help us and give us some grace and strength to respond to what we've heard. And oh, we wish we were more contented people. So please, in your kindness and love, you are the wonderful counselor. Teach us thy way, O Lord. Teach us thy way, thy gracious aid afford. Teach us thy way. Help us to walk aright. More by faith, less by sight. And to the heavenly light, teach us thy way. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.